Happy New Year to you. I hope you had a nice Christmas season. I was away in California. It was really hard out there. Temperatures in the 60s, sunshine. I just kept a snow shovel in my car just to remind me. <laughs> no, that's not true, actually. <laughs> yeah, why did I come back? It was really actually very beautiful out there. It was sunny the whole time. Oh, I guess there was some rain. It got a little snowy in certain places, but uh, um, it was uh, really lovely. Um, I would like to remind um, you, the elders particularly, there are uh, first of all, there's board meeting tomorrow. Board meeting, those of you on the board, 7 o'clock. No, it's not 7, it's 6. 6. Is it 6? And the elders, we should come about a half an hour early to pray. Also, uh, today is the uh, Holy Spirit uh, study. Those of you that would like to come, uh, please come. I think that's it. Let's uh, pray. Father in heaven, I pray you be with us today and thank you for life and a new year together. Bless us together, I pray, Lord, as we are your people. We desire your presence here at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. One time when I was in college, actually, long, long ago, the dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> um, some friends of mine and I decided we would go out and... Uh, take part in an Easter celebration in Riverside. I went to La Sierra College and there was a place uh, in Riverside called Mount Rubido and they had a sunrise service there. I had never gone to one before and so thought I would like to see what it was like. So some of my friends from the college went out to this service. It was a beautiful day as the sun arose and we praise, uh, prayed and sang hymns and had communion. However, I was surprised when they passed around a regular loaf of unsliced bread for the service. Each of us broke off a piece and ate it for the service. But I was used to that flat bread. You know the kind of bread we have here for communion? It's flat and kind of chewy and even dry. Um, not bread I would normally like to have at home. How about you? Some people like this bread, uh, but I'm not really that interested in it. It's unleavened bread, and that's what we use for communion. It has no yeast or rising agents in it of any kind. Now, most churches actually use this kind of bread for communion. The Catholics do, the Lutherans do, and the Baptists do. Methodists, on the other hand, use a regular loaf of bread that's just like what you have every day at home. So why do we use unleavened bread for communion when it's really not that nice, actually, thank you very much? And the reason is, is we because we understand that we should use this kind of bread because it's the kind of bread the Passover, the Israelites used for Passover. And it is described in our scripture today, as was read. In fact, God was so serious about this that if you didn't use unleavened bread, you were cast out. That's a pretty severe penalty just for not liking this flat bread. You can read about it uh, as uh, I'll just repeat the portion that he read in Exodus 12. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses, and whoever eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel, whether he is an alien or native born. Well, that's a pretty severe penalty. Even today, during Passover, the Jews have a little ceremony. They actually send the children out into the house, and they search for leaven. They look in the corners of the under the bed, everywhere to see if there's any leaven to get rid of it. What's wrong with leaven? What's wrong with yeast? 
Why did God institute such a severe penalty for having it in the house? What was he thinking? Leaven in dough results in fermentation. And in a sense, it's a type of corruption. If you're acquainted with yeast, you know they use yeast for making bread because yeast actually makes alcohol. And the yeast, the alcohol and the carbon dioxide that the yeast makes makes little bubbles and so the dough rises up with all those bubbles. It's the same sort of stuff they use to make beer. And so it's a sense, a type of sin. The Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, were to leave sin behind. They were to become God's special people, a chosen nation, a holy nation. So the eating of unleavened bread was to be a ceremonial lesson for them to remember what God had done for them and what they were to become. We can see this actually most clearly in the New Testament. Jesus in Luke 12, 1 told the disciples, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So he likened yeast to sin. Paul also likens yeast to the teachings that cause corruption in character. In Galatians 5, 9, and in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, he says this, 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you already are. And so the absence of this in the bread is meant to mean the absence of sin in the life. Because of this, because of this, Jesus chose this bread as a symbol of himself. In the New Testament, the Passover service was replaced with the Lord's Supper. Jesus said at the supper, the bread, this bread is my body broken for you. And he had to be without sin to be our savior. One could even say that God in the old covenant of Israel stipulated that there should be no leaven in the bread so that when Jesus used it in the New Testament, it would be an appropriate representation of him and his sacrifice for us. So that in fact, God was thinking ahead in the Passover meal. I want this bread that represents my son. I want this bread to be without sin as a symbol so that you can know in fact that he was without sin. There's another name for this bread and it's not a pleasant name. We find it in Deuteronomy 16. So let's turn to Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16. Verses, six, verses 1 through 3. Observe the month of Abib and celebrate the Passover of the Lord your God. Because in the month of Abib, he brought you out of Egypt by night, sacrificed as the Passover to the Lord your God, and an, an animal from your flock or herd at the place the Lord would choose as a dwelling place for his name. Do not eat it with bread made with yeast, but for seven days eat unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, because you left Egypt in haste, so that all the days of your life you may remember the time of your departure from Egypt, the bread of affliction. Why does God call it the bread of affliction? You know, I don't know if you've ever been afflicted Sometimes we say, I'm, he was afflicted with polio paralysis. Affliction is something that comes on you that is unpleasant. You don't like it. A disease, for instance, or else 
a, a circumstance in which you are troubled by something that is not pleasant at all. We don't like to hear about slavery because others afflicted people. They afflicted slavery on others. And God calls this bread the bread of affliction. So when you're taking communion today, you're taking the bread of affliction. Why was this? First of all, the Israelites were to be leaving Egypt, the place of slavery. This bread was to remind them of the affliction and trouble that they experienced there and that they had left in haste. You know, I like this idea of leaving in haste. They ran out. And of course, they had, they had to gather their things quickly. And so I don't know what happens when you leave someplace quickly. I always forget something. Isn't that it? Oh, look what we left behind. Oh, no. This bread of affliction reminds that they had to leave quickly, and I bet they left stuff behind. And they had to leave it behind. This bread of affliction reminds us that we leave sin behind and that when we go to heaven, we leave this old earth behind. Likewise, we are here on earth. Secondly, we are here on earth and not in heaven. We experience suffering and pain and the result of sin. This is not the bread of our usual table, this communion bread. It's the bread of trouble and pain and poverty. You know, rich people in those days never ate this stuff. They always ate the good bread. You know, I like Panera bread myself. Not this bread. I'd rather eat rye Panera. Now that's good stuff. Or some wheat bread that I can get up at Berrien Springs. But this bread, would you ever prefer it? And since we don't prefer it, God knows we don't prefer it. And he wants to remind us that, in fact, you're taking this bread because it's not your preference. It's the bread of affliction. Thirdly, Jesus shared this bread with us at the Last Supper, the first communion meal, and says he will not eat again until the time in heaven. He left heaven to join us here on earth and to save us. And so he partakes in this affliction. There's something else about this that should be noted. Paul calls our affliction a light affliction. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.17. 2 Corinthians 4.17. He talks about the trouble he has as, a, as, a, as an apostle and then says this, therefore, in verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Every one of you, especially you older ones, know we are wasting away day by day. The Bible doesn't downplay this. But then he says this, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. This bread represents our light affliction, but for Jesus, it was no light affliction. We can read about his affliction in Isaiah chapter 53. You're all familiar with this. Verse 1, well, let's see, verse 3, 5, and 7. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not five. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. For he was oppressed and afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. So this unleavened bread we eat is rich in symbolism. 
The supper is a celebration, and we are so, and we are to be happy that we can partake with joy. But the bread also reminds us that this place is not our home. We are looking forward to a better place, a heavenly home. And it also reminds us of the trouble that God went to in order to bring us to heaven. He paid a large price for our salvation. He tasted the darkness of sin that separated him from his father. We will only understand the depths of this darkness when we stand on the sea of glass and see how really it is there and what he left for us. So, partake of this unleavened bread of affliction with joy. But remember this, that this, what this usual, un, this unusual bread means, not joy, but sacrifice and trouble. Before we have our communion, we celebrate, we celebrate the foot washing, and we've changed our place of uh, washing a little bit. The men, instead of meeting over here in this room, will meet in the cradle roll room, the beginner's room, which is right back here. Couples will meet back in that room there on the corner, and the ladies will meet in the fellowship hall. I wish you a blessing as you partake, and we will meet back here for the communion service. Amen.